again. <clears throat> Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us again for another Australian Football Services podcast. My name is Anil Kapoor. I'm the Operations Manager of uh, Australian Football Services. I'm joined today, as always, by the co-director, Omar Okokoglu, and a very special guest. who will be a very familiar face to anyone who follows football, particularly if you call yourself an Australian. Uh, with a career that spans over 20 seasons, including La Liga, English Premier League, Serie A, 127 professional goals, 27 goals for his nation, including the penalty that took Australia to the World Cup and reawakened the Australian football dream. John Aloisi, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me on. Uh, John, for the uninitiated, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your history in football, please? Uh, yeah, where do I start? I, I will start back when I, I grew up in Adelaide. Um, I grew up, uh, I was born in Hectorville, which is eastern suburbs of Adelaide. And, uh, you know, I, I played football as a kid, especially in the winter and a bit of cricket in the summer. And, uh, and that was because of my dad. He was a big cricket fan. Um, but started really playing uh, you know, in a club side at the age of five. And uh, that was with a team that could allow five-year-olds to play. That was at Ingle Farm. And then a couple of years later, I went to Adelaide City at the age of seven. Uh, to play in the under 10s and from there that's where I spent all my junior days and uh, I have really great memories there uh, I, I think that, that that's where I really fell in love with the game um, because it was like a second home if not probably my home uh, because you spend you know nights there uh, your parents are there uh, either you know coaching which my dad did do a lot of coaching my brother was playing my sister was Miss Adelaide City at one stage <laughs> um, and <laughs> and then um, I ended up uh, spending weekends going to watch the National League side play, which is, if people understand what the National League means, it's, it's the old equivalent of the A-League. And, um, and I supported them as a kid, and my dream was to play for Adelaide City. And I got to do that at the age of 15, um, playing their first team. Um, then I went to the Institute of Sport with uh, a great group of players and probably ones that were household names in the end. Uh, Mark Viduka, Josip Skoko, Craig Moore, Clint Bolton, uh, that's just to name a few. Um, and then took, took off overseas um, just before I turned 17 to Belgium, and, uh, which was uh, a tough uh, first step into Europe. Um, first of all, at Standard Liège, I was in their reserve team for six months and then signed for Royal Antwerp. Um, spent two years there and then from there moved to Italy, uh, to England, to, to Spain um, and then back to Australia. So that's a brief run about my career in terms of where I started and where I ended up. Well, um, that's, that's quite a bit of an experience that you went through um, at a young age, especially when going to, um, you know, to, to Belgium. Um, but you know what, I, I just want to touch base. You probably get this question always asked about this, uh, this penalty against Uruguay. Um, I, I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, could you give us a rundown on what was going through your, your mind before taking the penalty uh, and, and after seeing the ball go into the back of the net? Yeah, it was um, it was a, a surreal moment, really, because uh, everyone asked me if I felt nervous, and uh, and to be honest, I didn't. And the only time I felt a little bit nervous was when Mark Viduka missed his penalty, and I was like, "Oh, this is getting a little bit, you know, it could, it could go wrong here. If, if Viduka can miss a penalty, then it means that we all can." Um, <laughs> but then Swartzy saved the next one, so um, you know, I. I remember walking from the halfway line and I was just so focused that, um, you know, people asked me what I was feeling and, and I couldn't even hear really any noise. I could only hear murmurs. And, um, you know, I was that focused and confident I was going to, going to score that, um, you know, all I was saying to myself as I was walking from the halfway line to the penalty spot is do exactly the same thing as you did the day before in training um, because I stayed, uh, behind with Lucas Neal and Ante Kovic and practice penalties down that end and practice yeah. all five in the same corner. <laughs> so I, I, I knew where I was going to hit the ball. I knew uh, my, my run-up was in line with the, the right post, right-hand post and on the 18-yard. And so my focus was just on the ball. Um, and as soon as I struck it, I knew I struck it well. It felt clean off the boot. Uh, <laughs> my, my, my head was down. As I sort of look up, I see the net sort of start to move. And I'm thinking, 
I, I think that's him. And <laughs> as, as I'm running off, you can just see that my face is a little bit, because within like this half second, there's no noise because no, yeah. no one's cheering yet because they don't <laughs> even know if it's gone in. And then as soon as I hear the crowd cheer, I realise that was in and um, I ran around like a maniac. But the, where I did run was where my family was sitting because I, I found out the yeah. day before where they were going to sit. Yeah, yeah, nice. Would have been a very special moment, actually, running over to the family and being able to celebrate. Yeah, it was. It was a, it was a special moment because, you know, people don't realise what you go through in terms of uh, not only the build-up to that game, but you, your whole career, you know, that there's a lot of sacrifices you have to make. You know, my parents were there. The sacrifice of allowing their son to go over as a 16-year-old um, across the other side of the world. You know, my wife, uh, the kids, and, you know, they see all the ups and downs. You know, a lot of people don't see that side of things. You know, a lot of people either see the, the highlights and, and yeah. if you're lucky enough, you get a few highlights, but uh, <laughs> there's also a lot of tough moments. So yeah. it was good to celebrate it with them. Absolutely. Um, so, John, after you retired from the game, um, was coaching always the next step forward or was, it, was there something else in mind? And obviously we all know that you've, you've take, taken a step into coaching. Now, as a coach, when you see players on the pitch, do you miss playing? The first question, I started thinking about coaching more when I uh, was in Spain. I think at the beginning of my career, it was more about focusing on playing. Um, and the reason why I started to think about it more and more is that I, I started to really um, enjoy my football uh, when I was in Spain. That was probably where I enjoyed my football the most. And, uh, and I started to question why am I enjoying it so much? You know, I enjoyed the style of play. I enjoyed the coach that I had at that time. I had, um, his name was Javier Aguirre, who's a, a Mexican um, that coached the national team of Mexico. He's also coached Atletico Madrid, coached Japan. He's a pretty experienced coach. Um, and his assistant was really good. And um, so I used to have a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with the assistant, talking about tactics, really. And, um, and so that's when I started to think about coaching. And then when I came back to Australia, it was always in the back of my mind once I did retire that, um, you know, I'd step into coaching. So I knew sort of what I wanted to do and, and it virtually happened straight away uh, at Melbourne Heart with the youth team. Um, whether I miss playing, I always used to say to my players whenever I coach them, the only games that I really miss are, are the big games, like your derbies and, you know, if it's a, a really important game. And the reason why I say that is because by the end of my career, my injuries were that bad that I was so sore that I didn't really enjoy the pain of running around anymore. So um, I, I don't really miss it. I, you know, it, it feels so long ago. It's nearly 10 years coming in February since I played. Um, and I haven't played a game since. So it's, uh, it, it's something that, you know, I enjoyed my career again. You know, there's good moments. There's, there's not so good moments, but um, mm. I enjoyed it and, and was privileged to play a game that I loved. And passionate about and and uh, and I'm the same with with coaching I'm passionate about it wonderful nice uh, John what have you been doing since uh, 2018 uh, when you left the raw um, I, I went overseas and uh, visited quite a few of my old clubs I visited uh, Alaves and um, Osasuna and uh, spent some time with the coaches and, and with the you know the football department the directors of football I uh, watched a lot of football, I watched a lot of games. Um, yeah, was lucky that I, I could do it as well through a little bit of doing media work with Optus. So I was able to go watch, you know, Barcelona play against Liverpool and then the second leg in Liverpool, uh, which, which was amazing. It was uh, a great experience. I didn't think that could be topped until the next night I was over in Amsterdam watching the Ajax Spurs game. So, yeah. um, and, and the, the thing is, you know, I'm not only watching it as a... a, a pundit, a television pundit or a supporter, I'm also analysing and trying to pick up ideas and, you know, you're always evolving and, and trying to get better at, at what you do. So mm -hmm. uh, that's a little bit what I've been doing and, um, you know, quite a bit of reading in isolation, um, which uh, also helps. And, <laughs> and, um, and, and the media side is keeping me busy with, with Optus, you know, we uh, show all the Premier League games. So, um, which is good to be able to watch, a, you know, a top league and talk about it and the Champions League, which, you know, I, that's my favourite competition, you know, being able to yeah. talk about that. You know, it, it's, it's a, a job which I don't really call it a job. I call it, you know, uh, 
what we all love talking yeah. about is football. So <laughs> for me, it's, it's yeah. great. Absolutely. You know what they say, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, I've never worked a day in my life then. Because <laughs> <laughs> I literally haven't. <laughs> I've worked hard at what I do, but yeah. I don't class it as work. There we go. Um, now, John, with, uh, with the Raw, you were there for three years. Um, do you feel like you've achieved what you wanted to achieve at the club? Look, whenever you're coaching, the thing that you want to achieve the most is win the championship and, and, and win the, you know, the Premier's played and win the, the grand final. But I was under no illusions when I walked into the club. I, I realised what the club, uh, the, the situation they were in. Um, you know, when I stepped in, the, uh, the CEO had just walked out of the club. Um, we, the first day I arrived in Brisbane, we got kicked out of our training ground because they hadn't paid the bills. Um, <laughs> Super haven't been hadn't been paid to the players for over a year, um, so you know a player like Luke Braddon, who was going to be an important part of my squad, was able to leave um, because of that situation. So I sort of realised what was I was walking into, and um, you know what is success. You know we, we were one point away from winning the Premier's play that year. Um, you know I was able to sign someone like Jane McLaren that hadn't been playing regular football. Uh, so far in his career and, and, and brought him to, to Brisbane and you know he had uh, amazing two years scoring uh, 20 goals and 20 goals um, you know also was able to help uh, develop a little bit more in his career was Brandon Borello um, who ended up uh, being sold over to you know, Germany uh, during my stay and then also um, Demi Petratus was another big thing you know with uh, um, in terms of the, the way he kicked on uh, in those two seasons. And, uh, you know, it, it, would, it was enjoyable. We did, I think, when you look at it, and I look back now, I think we overachieved in the circumstances that we had to deal with. Um, and uh, they, were, they were very difficult. And um, they didn't get any easier over time. It actually got uh, a lot harder. And that was when I realised that I, I couldn't stay on anymore. I, I had to walk because... I didn't see that there was a light at the end of the tunnel in terms of the way it was going. So I, for me, it's important that, um, you know, take a step back, you know, have a, another um, sort of breather and um, then hopefully the next opportunity comes that uh, when you talk about achieving, I do want to win the title. And so uh, it's not easy with any club. You have to do it in the, in the right environment and make sure that you've got the right... Uh, you know, fit for your for your club and for your your style of football that you want to play. For sure, for sure, John. Just um, taking you one step back um, to the question about the A League. So, what's your assessment on the the 2019 um, 2020 um, A League season? Uh, it's been a difficult one <clears throat> for a few reasons. I think that the biggest reason is obviously the the COVID situation, um, okay. and 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 also I'm a little bit fearful of what we're going to have uh, what's going to happen next season in terms of you know we're losing a lot of players um, and um, and which is understandable because some of the players and we've seen come out and saying look they don't know where they're at they, they can't no one's actually given them the, the confidence that the you know they're going to be able to um, get the, the contract that they were on and they, they, they should be uh, getting paid um, and so it's a bit of a it's, a, it's a hard situation for both clubs and players. And I understand both sides. This is where, for me, we're in a little bit of a, a crossroads. If, if we do want to go uh, and go our separate ways and, and that uh, the competition has to be apart from the FFA and, and make it into, uh, um, you know, sort of, I wouldn't say breakaway, but, you know, that uh, the clubs can overlook. I still think there needs to be an independent uh, board that oversees it because then, you know, you're seeing the club's angle and also you're seeing the player's angle because at the moment, it just seems like there's there's no solution to the problem that we're, we're dealing with, which was player payments. And um, yeah. and, and, and that's that's hard because we want to, uh, we want to make sure the game keeps on going ahead and improving and the league, and I'm sure it will, but uh, the situation at the moment is not great. Well, hopefully it does improve before the, the start of next season because, yeah, it is it's definitely a bit worrying, uh, especially yeah. some of the reports with regards to, to players being asked to take pay cuts and, and all of that. It's, yeah. It's gonna Look, I can understand. 
I, I can understand the whole situation, you know, because every, no one knew this was going to uh, happen within the world with the, the COVID situation. So mm. what I'm talking about, the independent league that, would, that everyone was crying out for, that, that, that's, mm. there's no issue with that. But I still think there needs to be an independent board that can actually get the, the, the two parties together and make it happen. We, we're talking yeah. about the PFA and the clubs in general. And then I, I still think, you know, I don't want to be all doom and gloom because there's still positives. You know, I read about the National Second Division. This is something that I've spoken about for a number of uh, years that is important, mm -hmm. not only for development. I think it's something that um, other codes in Australia haven't got. If we can end up having a first, second division promotion relegation, you know, we, we've got a point of difference compared to all the other codes. And we don't need to worry about the other codes. But what I'm trying to say is that everyone's worried about, you know, where's football going? No, no, we, we're... We're a global game. We're, we're in a unique position that our game is played all over the world. It's the number one sport in the world. You know, promotion relegation actually um, helps everyone, helps player development, helps coach development, helps, uh, you know, the actual, uh, the game improve because the spectacle improves because there's pressure situations of getting relegated or getting promoted, you know, winning championships and, and all those things. And, uh, I think that's important for, for us to end up um, having that. And, uh, and also the winter comp. I think that, that people have seen that the, the, the football standard improves because of playing in those winter months. And uh, that's another thing that we've spoken about. So I think aligning the leagues and, and, uh, and um, actually um, playing in the winter months is going to help our competition and the spectacle, that's for sure. Um, now, John, just um, with regards to your thoughts about football in Australia in general, now, um, a lot of coaches are, are taught to follow the, you know, the Australian football system. What are your thoughts on the system on a, as a whole? I mean, with your experience of having gone overseas and observed different types of systems, where do you think we sit in terms of um, creating chances and, and just developing football in the nation? And I think everyone got a little bit confused by the whole situation. And I can understand why, because um, it, the curriculum, it did state early on that, you know, a 4-3-3 and, um, and we've been talking about this, but um, over the years they've, they've said, you know, you can adapt to that. You know, it doesn't need to be that sort of uh, way of playing. I've also been to NTC challenges and I've, I've seen that they've made teams play everyone the same way. Now where this can actually be, detrimental to everyone is that we're only used to or coaching our players to then play against the same system as that what you play so um, when you know around Europe and around the world and even when we're growing up you, you play uh, against different systems you play against different styles and and uh, and that helps you develop as a player uh, the, the biggest thing that um, I see over in Europe now is that uh, kids are playing you know 60 odd games a year um, our kids uh, are playing, you know, way too little. And, and if they are playing more games, they're still not playing against the best. The best aren't playing against the best, whereas in Europe, they, they virtually are. And I know it's different because it's a lot closer. And, and, um, but, you know, we still can actually play more games. Um, the coaching is better. I will say that, uh, that there's a, I think we've got a lot of good coaches, not only at senior level. I think we're developing better coaches. Um, and now it's up to us to actually try and develop better players. And I think through playing more games and against different styles of football, which is important. Touching base on uh, coaches, uh, how would you describe your coaching style? Um, oh, it's, it's a little bit hard to, you know, talk about <laughs> yourself, how you are as a coach. You know, it's, um, look, I, I love to, to get involved, but the, you know, the hands-on style of coaching, but you also, I know when I have to have a, a take a step back and also have my coaches around me get in, involved in, in, you know, training because it, they're important because, um, you know, sometimes they will see something that you're not seeing. Um, or they're taking a session that, uh, you know, you might actually take a step back so you can overlook everything. Um, I, I like to get involved uh, heavily in the analysis side of things. Um, you know, I think that that's a very good learning tool, especially for players nowadays coming through. Um, you know, that they see things probably more on the screen than what they will on the training ground. Even though you have to train it on the training ground, you, you also have to actually do it uh, on the screen because... Um, 
you know, they're in front of screens all day, all, all the time anyway. Um, so I, I think it's a great learning tool. So I, I like to get involved in that. And another thing is, you know, I understand a lot of the time where the players might be coming from and how they're feeling um, because I've been through it as well. So, you know, it's yeah. important that, the, that you understand, you know, even though you're a coach and, and you're trying to, you know, get things, you know, a sort of system working or, or your, your, your play working, you know, there's also the personal level of being um, around individuals. They're all different. Um, but, yeah. you know, they might have uh, uh, have some issues at home or, or, you know, that you don't know if social media is actually getting to them because they might be getting a lot of stick on social media. So it's, it's uh, important that you understand how a player is feeling as well. And, you know, those things uh, for me, um, it's important to know. And then, then you deal with it in, in a certain way that you think is best. So, so you can pretty much say that you are also a counsellor um, as well as a coach for the players. Oh, yeah, you definitely <laughs> are a counsellor. That's for sure. <laughs> well, you, well you, you're like a, how can I say, you're like a parent, but you can also be like a brother. You can also be like a friend. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's not like I, I used to go out with the players because I never did. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's you also have your distance because you also have to make tough decisions that they're not always going to understand. But yep. the, the one thing that I did always say was every decision that I made was uh, for the best of the team or what I felt was best for the team and the football club. Now, um, and once you explain that to players, then they understand that, uh, you know, you're there to, to actually help the team um, and only 11 players can play. You know, not all of yeah. them can play. Yeah. Um, John, some people have been saying that the connection between A-League clubs and the NPL clubs in each state is not particularly good, really with domestic players not getting a good chance to step up to the A-League. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? And also, do you follow the NPL? Yeah, look, I understand where, where people are coming from and, and I do get it. The, the issue that we had and we've had in the past is that, um, you know, NPL has played at a different time of the year to A-League. And, uh, and so sometimes, you know, the opportunity for players isn't there, you know, to take that step, uh, that next step. Um, I've, I've always followed NPL. There's a few reasons why, because, you know, I played uh, in the old State League when I was growing up. So... You know, especially growing up in Adelaide, I know a lot of the teams, so it's always good to follow. Uh, in Sydney and Melbourne, um, a lot of the teams that, you know, are in the NPL used to be in the old National League, so I take a keen interest. And, and up here in uh, Queensland, because I was coaching, I, I always had to have an understanding of what the environment was like uh, in terms of what players were going around, who the coaches were, you know, what kind of football um, because if you ever did take a player, you had to know if he was able to fit into your style or your system. Um, and, you know, we, we had that with Wenzel Halls, uh, that we took him from Western Pride. Um, so we, we sort of, you know, knew what he was doing. And we did know what he was doing in the local league, in the NPL. Um, and so we had a good idea what he was all about. But it will change once we align the seasons and next season will be more aligned because of the, the, the start of the A-League. Um, and I think that will be another step into the right direction. Having a, a first, second division, then of course it's going to be even, you know, the gap will close a lot more and uh, there'll be more opportunities for NPL players, if you want to say that. So um, it, it will get better. And in the past, I understand that it has been hard for a lot of NPL players. Fair enough. John, uh, being a, a coach yourself, do you follow any coaches in the, the A-League or NPL? Follow all coaches in the A-League because uh, you have to be uh, uh, you know, across what's going on. If I do end up getting another job in the A-League, <laughs> I have to know how the, the opposition coaches are playing. And, and uh, yeah. you know, even the messaging that they get across you know, in media, um, you know, how, how they are with their players. It's, it's important to know that stuff. And, and also, you know, because I follow the, the, the local leagues and, and, you know, I've uh, always kept a keen eye on who's around and what coaches, you know, up here in Brisbane with Olympic, Ben Khan, who's a, he's a young, promising coach. You know, I've kept an eye on him. Down in Adelaide with Camptown City, we're doing well for a long period. Joe Mullen, who uh, was an ex-Adelaide City player, 
um, you know, then, you know, in Melbourne, uh, Ricardo Macchioli, he's, uh, you know, a young coach at uh, uh, Brunswick City. Um, you know, he's been doing some good things. Um, you know, in Sydney, uh, Luke Wilkshire, who's uh, he, he won the title last year with Wollongong Wolves. So, you know, I, I sort of keep across, it's hard to keep across every single coach. Um, but, you know, you do hear things, you do, you know, take a, a liking to it. You know, also I know Ante Juric at Sydney Olympic and um, also follow him in the W League, what he's been doing. Um, so, I, I, you know, I enjoy that side of things and, 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 you know, see who the next up and coming coaches are. And, you know, if I need to look out for them or need to work <laughs> with them, you never know what, what, you know, what's around the corner in football. Of course, of course. <laughs> um, John, I, I just have to commend you on... on uh, pointing out Ben Khan, I spent one one season at Olympic a few years ago, and I have always had a, a, an affinity towards that club. And honestly, of the NPL coaches that I am aware of, I am absolutely baffled by how he is able to achieve what he has been able to achieve with a squad. I mean, you know, if you look at the club, there's always been some sort of issue behind the scenes that most people don't know about. However, He's come in and he's been able to basically revitalize that entire club from top to bottom. And to do it consistently season after season, I think you're 100% spot on. He's, he's doing excellent work there. Yeah, I look, I first um, heard about Ben when he was down at the Mariners with the youth mm -hmm. team. Um, so I knew about him back then. And then when he uh, came up here with Olympic, uh, I kept a close eye and, and seeing how he, he was doing. And, um, and also he went to go watch the grand final against... Um, uh, Queensland Lions, um, which was a few years ago now. Uh, I'm trying to remember which year. Years go past pretty quick for me, um, so I can't remember which year. But it was uh, so. You know, he he has done really well. And and look, it's not only doing well in terms of results. You also have, you look at a style of football and you think you know can that sustain success? And uh, he has been able to sustain. You know, his team being up near the top with you know uh, Olympic over the last few years. Um, John, you, we've already mentioned um, in, in passing some information about you know second professional league. Um, any other thoughts that you have about it in terms of how it would benefit? I mean, we've obviously talked about the leagues aligning and having a development sort of scope for, for younger players. Um, any other sort of um, benefits of having a professional B league? Oh, I, I think it, it helps with everyone. It helps with um, not only with you know the development of players, development of coaches, development of referees. Um, also gives hope to clubs, you know, that, uh, that they could get promoted into, hopefully uh, sooner rather than later, get promoted into the A-League. Because if they do get promoted, you know, it gives them hope, you know. And, and I just think it, it creates a better spectacle and um, for everyone that um, if we've got, you know, these important games and something to play for and, you know, you're talking about clubs with history now. You're talking about clubs with, you know, over 60 years of history that have got, you know, there's, there's meaning behind behind that. And uh, mm -hmm. and getting them involved, the old and the new, I love that concept. And uh, yeah. and I, I think that will just help everyone. So we, we're not only talking about one aspect, we're talking about a lot of different things. And, uh, you know, even I think the media outlets would love the opportunity for to, you know, the show games that, you know, a promotion relegation or last game of the season, you know, a, a team fighting relegation. I've been involved in it. It's not nice as a player, but it's a great <laughs> spectacle. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, John, you mentioned about um, your thoughts on the, the future, future coaches. Um, and what's your thoughts on the, the coaching system um, in Australia? What do you mean by coaching system? The, the, the way that we're developing coaches? or the, that's, Well, yeah, that's, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, I, look, I, I think that um, we're developing good coaches now. I, I've got a theory behind that. I think the coach education is good, but I also think that um, we've, we've had really good coaches, and, and I'll talk about the you know, two top ones that everyone uh, knows about, Ange Postacoglu and, uh, and Graham Arnold. Now, they lift the level for all of us uh, younger coaches to get to and aspire to and you learn off of coaching against them um, a lot of coaches have learned under them uh, like Steve Corica um, and then when you're coaching against each other and you're learning off each other and it's not only at A-League level it's also it filters down because you end up doing you know um, licenses together 
um, you know, and people end up coming to watch you in training and seeing what you're doing. And then, so that ends up improving. And that, that's not only here in Australia, that, that happens all over the world. And I think that we're in a, actually a really good moment at the moment for coaches in terms of, you know, we talk about golden generation of players. I think we've got a really good golden generation of coaches um, that can go on to another level. And what I talk about going to another level, go coaching at the highest level in Europe or Asia. For sure. Um, John, what are your future goals? Do you have any ambitions of um, coaching in Europe? Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to coach in Europe one day. Um, hopefully I will, you know, in, in the future. Um, you know, last time I was there, the, I was talking to, you know, some of my ex-clubs because that's, that's also a, a, a way maybe in, into coaching in Europe uh, because it's not easy. Look, there, there's plenty of coaches around the world. So sometimes you need a little bit of uh, luck and you need someone to actually know, you know, what you're about as a, as a person, as a coach. Um, you know, fit their philosophy, fit their culture, um, and you know you might get that opportunity. And then once you do, you know it's up to you to take it. But um, yeah, I'd love to coach again in Europe. Or we'll go good. back to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good, um, John. Uh, just uh, in a nutshell, um, if you were to compare the football in Europe to Australia. Just generally, you know, general player quality, um, the youth development, the attitude of the players, uh, you know, what, what would you say? Uh, I think that we're, at the moment, we're, technically, we're not too bad. Um, I think that, uh, tactically, players still lack a lot. And why that is, is because they don't play enough football as young players against different sort of, you know, oppositions that play different systems and styles of play. Um, so, you know, a player um, that, that gets to 21 in Europe is, uh, you know, is already accomplished. Whereas here, they're still learning the game um, a lot. And, and that's, that, that's, for me, a, a big difference. Plus, because we haven't had this sort of promotion relegation for a number of years, um, our players end up um, not—I wouldn't say complacent, become become complacent, but they don't know how to deal with the pressures of being in, in Europe, where it's dog eat dog. You know, it, yeah. it's uh, you know, you don't want to get relegated because you know the, the wages could drop, plus you could get a, a hell of a lot of abuse from fans for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so it's pretty much survival of the fittest. Yeah, and and so we, we haven't got that really here. You know, we're we're comfortable. It's it's a comfortable uh, way of being and, and a comfortable life. And you know, it's not only that I'm saying it. You know, a lot of the foreigners that come here actually say it, and 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 they they see it. So it, it's something that um, I think when we talk about having first second division, that will help um, develop stronger players. And I'm talking about players with with you know strong mentalities that can deal with pressures, can deal with adversity, yep. can deal with setbacks, because that's what makes you a better player. Nice. Absolutely. Um, John, with what you've observed here, I mean, with youth and professional players, uh, what are your thoughts on their capabilities? Do you think they can play in Europe? Um, yeah, a little bit on that. There's, there's definitely players that can play in Europe. And at the moment, we're starting to see a few more go at an early age. Um, and and I think that's a good sign because we had, a, I think, 15, well, probably less than 15, a 10-year gap there where we didn't have academies coming through our A-League system. Um, you know, then we lost the Institute of Sport. So now we're starting to see probably the first, you know, real signs of players coming through these uh, A-League academies um, that end up going, you know, now early to Europe. Uh, you know, a few boys from uh, the Under-17, last Under-17 World Cup have made that step. Now we'll see if they end up being able to stay there and, and, um, and you know, develop into, you know, good professional players to play at the highest level. But um, there is a big gap at the moment. We're not really well respected at the moment in Europe in terms of our, our players as we used to be, you know, because uh, we really haven't had a lot of players do well in recent years. Yeah, yeah. Um, look, uh, John, it looks like we're running a bit out of time. Uh, but just last question, uh, what would be your advice to the coaches and to the players for you know the, the the young players coming up up and coming young players 
Um, I know he, he, up and coming young players is uh, you know kit and coaches. Well, I, I look, I think that the most important thing is is working hard and uh, keep on improving and, and keep on developing. And not only if you're a player, if you're it, it's the same when you're a coach, and keep on learning. And uh, I think that's the most important thing. And the the, the biggest thing we we're quick to look for you know, uh, excuses sometimes, but, you know, sometimes you need to make sure that you do everything possible yourself to get the best out of yourself and to, that you can go on to the next level and not look for an easy excuse. So I think that's uh, important that, you know, players keep working and, and, and looking for the right way to, to move forward. For sure. Well, John, thank you very, very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. We'd uh, no love to have you back any time. And uh, good luck with, uh, with the next steps in your, in your career. We'll definitely be following and uh, cheering you on as always. Thanks. And, uh, Thanks again for having me on. Yeah, Thanks, uh, Will. You too. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So, guys, thank you very much again for joining us for another Australian Football Services podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, if you have any questions for myself, Omar, or John, please feel free to comment on the video and we'll get back to you. Thanks. Until next time, take care and have a great day.